Well, it's absolutely wonderful that you can join us again for our series on the book of Revelation. And as we begin to roll back the canvas, you're going to be able to see a lot more information that will be beneficial and helpful to your understanding of this very intriguing book, this very intriguing subject. Uh, today, we are very grateful that you can gather with us with your Bible. Hopefully, you will have a Bible open, and you'll also have a pen or pencil and some notes. And uh, if you wish, you can have a cup of tea and coffee. Just relax as we get into the study. First of all, I want to commend you for persevering so far in having covered the other two uh, uh, areas and because we, we, we've looked at some very technical issues, and I want to assure you the most, inf the most uh, informative parts of our studies uh, are yet to follow. So I trust you will find this very, very helpful. If anything about the book of Revelation troubles people, most people, it's got to do with the number 666. But in addition to that number, which is found in Revelation chapter 13, are the opening verses of that chapter. And we're going to read that today. So if you could turn with me to Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to start from the first verse. We're going to cover some very important areas. This is right in the very center, right in the middle of the 22 books of the book of Revelation. And uh, we're dealing with this, and then we're going to go into Daniel, and then hopefully with the studies that follow, we're going to get into more intriguing and nitty-gritty issues that are found in uh, the Scriptures, especially in the book of Revelation. So turn with me, please, to uh, Revelation chapter 13. No matter what translation you are using, it's going to make a tremendous amount of sense. Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to pick up the reading there. And this is what it says from the first verse. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. We stop there before we continue. The sea has always been symbolically representative of nations. It's a sea of nations. And this beast is going to rise up from the sea of nations. And this beast will have seven heads and ten horns. And on his horn, ten crowns. And on his head blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave his power, and his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast." So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. That's three and a half years. The last three and a half years of the seven years of tribulation will be when the... Uh, beast, which we're going to look into what the beast is, is going to exert a lot more power. In the first three and a half years, there's relative calm and peace, although the Antichrist, who we will learn more about, uh, would have already come to power. Let's look at these verses, and I'm going to go from section to section and explain exactly what this is all about. So if you read this for the first time, or maybe the second time, or you've often read it, you will have questions. What does it mean about this beast? What is this beast? Is it a literal beast? No, it's a metaphor of the nations and the governments that govern and rule over those nations. Who are the seven heads, and why ten horns, and why ten crowns, and heads of blasphemous name? What is that all about? Well, what we need to understand here, that the seven heads of the beast represent seven empires or seven international global governments. 
that would have either come or will still come into existence. And then when it speaks of the ten horns, the horn in the Bible symbolically always speaks of power. The horn speaks of power, so they will have authority and power. And they will be given this power and reign like kings. That's the reason why there are ten crowns. And this blasphemous name that it's making reference to, that these seven heads or seven governments will exert, that blasphemy, that blasphemy would be them acting as if they are God. Because anyone who acts on behalf of God in the sense of substituting God and seeing themselves as final, ultimate authority, that is blasphemous in the sight of God. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. So now he's explaining the characteristics of this beast. We must not look at this beast in a singular sense because it's talking about seven different kingdoms and seven different empires. But the characteristic of this beast would be that it would be like a leopard. And we're going to be looking at that in the book of Daniel later on. And his feet are like a bear. All of these characteristics, like a bear, like a leopard, and like a lion, all of those descriptive labels that are given to the beast has to do with past empires and governments. And then the dragon gave him his power. Who is the dragon? Well, we know who the dragon is. The dragon being that old serpent, Lucifer. Luciferian power will be given to the beast. The beast will be a conglomerate of nations coming together with seven different heads, so to speak, that have come and gone. They represent the governments of the past historically and also the governments of the future. Now, as we consider that, we're going to have a look at one of the heads being wounded. Mm. Now, they worship this dragon and they also worship the beast. And what really impressed all the nations of the world was that one of the heads that was wounded was healed. Now, there have been many commentators over the years who have believed that this is speaking about the Antichrist who will be assassinated and that his head will be wounded in some way and that he would rise from the dead being a sort of uh, a copying of the Lord Jesus Christ's death and resurrection because the Antichrist will be a type of Christ. Um, whilst that is plausible, that's plausible and, and, and acceptable in many ways, however I believe in the context of this passage, it is not speaking about one single entity, it is actually speaking about this beastly system one of the heads would be damaged in such a way that you'd never ever think it would ever be able to survive. And we're going to consider that that fits in absolutely perfectly with over the last 1,700, 1,800 years, the Roman Empire was destroyed. And this is going to be a revival of the empire which is going to get the world to stand back. How can an empire that has lived and died be resurrected. I believe that that is another viewpoint that is equally plausible. So let's narrow this down. If we look at the context, it is talking about the dragon being Lucifer, who is going to give power to this beastly system, which will be a government, that will come together using all of the characteristics of previous governments and empires that have come before it. And therefore, Revelation 13, 1 through to 5, is dealing with this particular system. And remember that authority, the same authority that Lucifer has, Luciferian authority, the power of Satan, he's going to impart to this particular entity that consists of all the characteristics of previous governments. And it is going to speak great blasphemies and speak against the God of heaven and even claim to be 
of God and divinely inspired. And the world is going to be so impressed and the world is going to follow. Now, that is the explanation of this beast that's coming out of the sea. So I'm going to recap on that. Firstly, it comes from the sea of nations. Secondly, there are seven heads, which speaks of seven empires, which we look at closer now. Then there will be ten horns that will emerge from these seven uh, global empires, and those ten horns speak of power and authority. And uh, the rulers of these ten horns will in actual fact wear ten crowns. Each of them will wear a crown. The crown represents some sort of sovereignty or monarchy or power that's given to it as a king. It will reign. They will reign as a king. And then it goes on to say that the beast has the characteristic of a leopard, the characteristic of a bear, and some of the charism charis uh, 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 characteristics when one considers it speaks with a mouth like a lion. And the dragon continues to give power, which is Lucifer. So I think that that really makes a tremendous amount of sense. And if you consider that these things are going to carry on at this particular level for three and a half years, 42 months. Having, having established that now in Revelation 13, let us go back to the book of Daniel. And we're going to see that in the book of Daniel, God reveals to Daniel when he's in exile and taken into captivity by the Babylonian Empire, God actually speaks to him and reveals that all of these governments of the world, God sees them as predatorial beasts. Predatorial beasts. That's what governments are, and that is what has transpired in history and continues to uh, function today. Predatorial leaders. Here we go, in Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, 4 through to 7. Daniel begins to share the insight that God has given to him concerning global empires. And this is what he says. Now you find Revelation 13 is going to make a lot of sense. Daniel 7, 4 through 7. The first was like a lion that had eagle's wings, and I watched till its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and was made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, and so on and so forth. Here we find that Daniel is explaining in Daniel 7, 4 through 7, four major empires. Some would follow Daniel and some had preceded Daniel. What is important here is to know that God is showing Daniel some truths concerning world powers. Why does this relate to Daniel? Daniel is a Jew. He is from Israel, and therefore God includes what is happening with Gentile nations in this narrative, in this book of Daniel, so that we can understand why these governments are included in the Bible, because it's all relative to Israel. It all relates to the plight that Israel will find herself in. And remember, empires and governments throughout the ages in history have always tried to destroy Israel because Israel is the apple of God's eye. As they become anti-God, they become anti-Israel. What is interesting, therefore, is that these particular beasts represent empires. And we will explain what empires they do represent. Now notice the first one is like a lion, and it stands on its two feet like a man. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, who was the ruler of the Babylonian Empire, he became so dominant in the world that he became the center, the epicenter of all authority. And he acted like a man in opposition to the things of God, and there were great things that he actually spoke of that 
Nebuchadnezzar, but God had to bring him down. So the lion, the image of the lion, represents the Babylonian Empire with Nebuchadnezzar. The next empire that actually follows is like a bear. And it is raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth. What is that all about? Well, the bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire. There was an empire in history that succeeded and destroyed the Babylonian Empire. And that was a combination of two forces, the Medes and the Persians. The Medes and the Persians, the Persians being the stronger of the two, thus represented by the image of the bear, where the one shoulder or one side was raised higher than the other side, indicating, <clears throat> indicating that it was more powerful than the Medes. However, the Persians and the Medes, together in an alliance, attacks Babylon and destroys the Babylonian Empire. And therefore, the bear speaks of a succeeding empire to that of the Babylonian Empire. It has three ribs in its mouth. That is speaking about the previous uh, empires that it has destroyed. Assyria, Egypt, Lydia, Asia Minor, and of course we have included in that Babylon. So three empires have been destroyed by the Medes and the Persians, the bear. That's why it's got those three ribs in its mouth, representing the destruction of the nations that it has defeated. And um, then it goes on to talk about a leopard that will replace that of the bear. And this leopard, no doubt, is a Grecian empire that will succeed the Medes and the Persians. And then following the leopard comes a beast that is nondescriptive. It is an awful-looking beast, representing an empire that succeeds the Grecian empire, namely the Roman Empire. Now that we have a picture of all of these creatures and what they represent in Daniel, we find that Revelation 13 begins to make a lot more sense, doesn't it? Revelation 13, when it's speaking of the, uh, the beast which looked like a leopard and had feet like a bear and had a mouth like a lion, these are all symbolic words that are used that are correlated with what has been said in the book of Daniel. I hope that makes sense. So what John writes in Revelation 13 would make absolutely no sense if one didn't have a proper understanding of Daniel. So we've looked at Revelation 13. We've gone back to Daniel to find out what these beasts are. We understand that these beasts are empires, and we are going to ask the question and answer the question, why does God show Daniel all of these uh, characteristics and all of these creatures? The reason why is because Daniel has been called in by Nebuchadnezzar to interpret ne ne Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And Nebuchadnezzar had an awful dream that kept him awake. But God has given Daniel insight to know what that dream is all about. And then ultimately, when Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel to give an interpretation, he gives the interpretation, which is found in Daniel 2. Now, it was only after Daniel was given insight into understanding Nebuchadnezzar's dream that God gives him more detail by giving him the images of the beast. So now we're going to get to Daniel 2, where Daniel is being called in by Nebuchadnezzar to give an interpretation of the image. And uh, Daniel is told and revealed, God reveals it to Daniel as well, uh, he actually tells Nebuchadnezzar what Nebuchadnezzar dreamt, which was absolutely mind-blowing. And uh, he now has Nebuchadnezzar's attention. And he says, you know, you have seen an image, its head of gold, and its chest and arms of silver, and its abdominal area of bronze. And you've also seen that this image has two legs of iron 
and that there are ten toes to this image, and the toes are made of iron and clay. I want to know what is this all about. But I'm also disturbed, he says, I've seen a little stone that has been cut out of the mountain, and this stone is racing towards the image, and it strikes the image on the feet, and the image comes crashing down. And then I see this little stone growing, growing bigger than a mountain, filling the whole earth. And I want to know what is that all about. So yeah, we have the story in Daniel chapter 2, 31 through 35. Let me read it to you. You, O king, were watching and behold a great image, and this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thigh of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet uh, of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. Then the iron and the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain. And eventually it grew until it filled the whole earth. And now the question is, what is the head of gold? The head of gold, Daniel explains to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, your majesty, your honor, let me assure you that this is speaking of your greatness, your empire, is more superior than any empire that's come before you or will follow you. It is represented by gold. The value of governments and the value of the world is determined by material goods. And therefore, gold is prime. Gold is a premium. Therefore, you will be made to be a mighty empire represented by the golden head. But following you will come an inferior empire, an empire that is not as great as your empire, but yet it will defeat your empire because you have lifted yourself up above the God that I serve. And this will be represented by, in the image by the chest and the arms made of silver. The reason why the arms, the two arms, represent the two Groups, namely the Persians and the Medes. And they will be inferior to you, Nebuchadnezzar, but they will defeat you and they will come into power. And that's precisely what happened. Retrospectively in history, we know that the Medes and the Persians conquered the Babylonian Empire and they became a mighty empire that controlled many. But then he said there is another very interesting development in that this image around the abdominal side, the belly and the thighs, represented by bronze, is the Grecian Empire. And this Grecian Empire will become mighty. And then after the Grecian Empire will come another empire that will be inferior to the Grecian Empire. The legs will be made of iron. The two legs, therefore, represent the division of the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire succeeded and conquered the Grecian um, enterprise, the result was that eventually Rome, the Roman Empire was divided into east and west. The west was under Rome itself and the east under Constantinople. And Constantine the, was the one who established that so the Roman Empire was weakened simply because it was divided from west to east, and also it became weakened because of governmental changes. But the mighty Roman Empire that the Romans thought would last forever, it died and will one day be revived. And the revival of the Roman Empire is symbolized in the feet of the image that is made of iron and clay. Now you and I know 
that iron and clay cannot form an alloy. You cannot fuse them into one solid. There will always be a weakness because clay does not mingle with iron and iron with clay. And therefore these ten kingdoms will try to be united under the old revived Roman Empire. But there will be weaknesses. There will be a fragmentation. There will be a vulnerability. And uh, that they will constantly struggle to form an alliance. And we believe that the struggle in Europe at the moment in trying to establish an EU that will become not only a superpower from an economic point of view, but from a military perspective, we are witnessing it before our eyes because iron and clay does not mix. It is brittle. And we would dare say that Britain, the UK that was once part of the EU, has highlighted the fact that the Roman Empire in the search and the quest to be united is brittle, just like iron and clay cannot mix, they are not mixing. But it is when the iron and clay empire comes to power, and they will come to power, that from their midst will rise up a man, like Nebuchadnezzar, the Antichrist. And this Antichrist will present himself as being not anti-God, so to speak, initially, but Antichrist does not mean against Christ, it means in the place of. Like a person gets married, you have an anti-nuptial. That's in the place of the nuptial agreement, an anti-nuptial. So the Antichrist is not necessarily against Christ initially, but comes portraying himself as one who comes in the place of Christ. And that is blasphemy. And we have witnessed that in governments of the world. Now, let's try to wrap this up, because we're going to end on that little stone and the big mountain. Now, the head of gold represented the Babylonian Empire. The vision that Daniel has of the beast is the first one was a lion. That correlates, corresponds perfectly with the head of gold. The chest and the arms of silver, the Medo-Persians, corresponds with the vision of Daniel the bear. The belly and the thighs and the bronze of the Greek empire, the leopard, corresponds absolutely perfectly with the leopard that Daniel sp speaks of. And then the legs of iron, the Roman empire, represents absolutely perfect this fierce beast that will conquer the world. And then, of course, the ten horns of Revelation 13 and also the ten horns of Daniel's prophecy coming from this beastly system. Those ten horns also are symbolized in the image as being the ten toes. So the ten horns and the ten toes is exactly the same thing. Speaking about the power. So when the world eventually reaches a point where there becomes ten regions or ten nations that will form an alliance, and from that alliance will emerge the Antichrist. It is at that time that God will send Jesus Christ back to earth. And when he descends, he will crush all the nations of the world. Christ, as we know, is the rock. He is the one that is that tiny stone that is mentioned in this vision. That tiny stone represents the kingdom of God on earth with Jesus as the Messiah. And when the kingdom of God is established, before he's established, he destroys all the kingdoms of this world and they turn into chaff and the wind blows them away. They're carried away. They're not even remembered anymore. And in their place... That little stone grows, grows until it becomes a mountain. And that represents the kingdom of God on earth, which is the promise that God has made to the Old Testament prophets and indeed the promise that Jesus spoke about of the kingdom, the perfect age, the utopian era that is to come, also referred to as the thousand years of peace. 
So friends, I think that we do have it all wrapped up here today um, in understanding the symbols and the images. I hope that it is uh, self-explanatory. Go through the notes and I'm sure it's going to make a tremendous amount of sense to you. So thank you very much for joining us. And remember, we usually end our talks with those wonderful words uh, in Hebrew, Yeshua Adonai, which is Jesus is Lord. Until next time, I greet you.